Hey, welcome everyone to another wonderful talk with GGP as we look back at 2021 and some of the great things that are going to be happening in 2022 uh, in video games, esports, education, you name it. I feel like we are going to hit all the topics today. And I am so thankful to be here with uh, Renee and Eunice. Uh, Renee, uh, introduce yourself and uh, some of your background. Yeah, of course. Hi, my name is Renee Gittens. I am the executive director of the IGDA, the International Game Developers Association. Been in the game industry for about a decade now, and I've done all sorts of roles, uh, mostly in programming and technical project management. You know, obviously at the IGDA, though, it's our mission to support and empower game developers around the world in achieving fulfilling and sustainable careers. So I help uplift other developers by uh, providing them with resources uh, such as white papers, webinars, you know, research papers, um, by also helping them connect with our communities. We have over 150 local chapters and special interest groups around the globe. Uh, and then by advocating what's best for game developers. On the side, I have my own indie studio working on a game called Potions of Curious Tale. And yeah, I just love video games. I love the game industry and I'm so happy to be here. Yes, please introduce yourself. Hi everyone, I'm so happy to be here as well. And my name is Eunice Chen. I'm the founder of Enlight.gg, which is a platform where we teach career development for people who wanna work in esports and gaming. And we do that through career coaching, we do that through curriculum, community, and masterclasses. So we have some incredible people, check it out on our website. Um, but before I started Enlight this year, I was actually a event lead at Riot Games. So I did all of the event strategy back in 2013. If you remember any of the League of Legends events back then, that was the first year that we actually did an event in a sports stadium at Staples Center. So that was a huge, huge thing that I was so fortunate to be able to work on and manage as an event on my belt. Um, and after that, I joined Cloud9 Esports the premier esports team um, that was when I was the first employee and executive hire at Cloud9. So I was also really fortunate to work alongside the founder for about five years, building every business unit throughout Cloud9 from business development to accounts, partnerships, management, marketing, and so on and so forth. So it's been really cool to see the esports industry grow, both from the developer and publisher perspective, but also from the esports team perspective. So what I'm working on with Enlight now is really focusing on building the next generation. So all of you that are, are watching here today, um, if you're interested in working or developing your career further in esports or gaming, that's what that's what exactly we're focusing on. Our our mission is to help you with that on that journey. Amazing, absolutely amazing. And I remember that uh, I was there at Staples Center to uh, to actually see that. That was it was huge. I I still can't believe that uh, a huge stadium like that could actually house uh, you know bring people together to watch a video game. So I was uh, congratulations on that. Now. Obviously, 2021 uh, didn't always shape up the way that we all planned. I believe uh, the pandemic still continues on. And part of that is, uh, you know, having to work uh, distance from other people. Uh, Renee, uh, how has that really affected uh, development studios? Uh, moving forward? Has that gotten better? Has that gotten worse? Like, what are some of the pros and cons now that people are finding out from, like, working uh, together apart? Yeah, remote working has been the biggest challenge that the game industry has faced in a long time. And I think that it has both pros and cons when it comes down to it. Obviously, there's been a lot of difficulty in maintaining the momentum of some game development uh, because of the difficulty of remote work and communication. It can be very hard to transition to working remotely when you're used to having an open office environment where you can pretty much passively collect information on what other people are working on, you know, how your team's doing. And it can be more difficult to have those creative calls, uh, those design discussions, those art discussions when you're doing it virtually versus in person. 
However, the, the benefit of working remotely is it provides a lot of time back to game developers. There's less commuting to worry about. They can spend more time, you know, connecting with their family. If they need to take a quick break or a long lunch, they can do it in a, an area that's comfortable to them. And uh, it allows for more people to join the game industry. The ability to really integrate remote contractors and employees is better than ever before. And so it really opens up the accessibility of the entire game industry to a wider group than we've ever seen before. Absolutely. Uh, Eunice, uh, obviously you're coming at this from like sort of like a big events, uh, more of a uh, audience focus. Uh, how has that sort of affected esports and what are people learning from uh, remote work uh, moving forward, obviously, as we go into 2022? Yeah, I, I actually agree. I mean, Renee, I think that working from home has just been a challenge for a lot of people, especially when some people might be isolated or there's just other distractions, personal distractions at home. So it's been huge and just the communication barrier uh, without being face to face. So completely agree with that. Um, I do think on a larger scale, it's been healthy for gaming as a whole. And, you know, 2021 is is uh, much different from 2020 when people were struggling and scrambling to switch to virtual mode. But 2021, I think you mentioned this as well, is, is when people started to get into the groove of learning how to communicate a little bit more better. Um, but also as a whole, I think that gaming obviously has just boom because everyone's stuck at home. There's nothing to do except play video games. Um, watch other people play video games. And so the general interest and viewership has risen so dramatically that the industry has, has garnered a lot of uh, interest and viewership. And so that's actually benefited a lot of companies uh, through, I mean, sales obviously is the bottom line, but it's also benefited a lot of companies through um, larger discussions around accessibility of these games, you know, more women playing these games, more LGBTQIA plus people playing these games, and more discussions around diversity and inclusion because now we see everyone playing games and it's a larger lifestyle um, hobby rather than, or I guess a part of our lifestyles, right? Instead of just being a side hobby or something we like hide in the corner. So I, I think it's been generally uh, really great for gaming and esports this year, just having to go virtual and being stuck in our homes. Yeah. Um, I really like that you were pointing out how, you know, gaming's become something that pretty much everyone does. Because I think that's that's true. And a few years ago, um, something that frustrated me and, and something that I think we're breaking through now that I didn't expect for several years is the concept of being a gamer. Like, by all means, I like being a gamer. Like, that is something I can relate to. If you look behind me, clearly it is something that I am passionate about. Um, but that's like somebody saying, like, I'm a music listener or like, I'm a movie watcher. You're like, all right, like that's just kind of what everyone does. And I think we're finally breaking through that point where games are just another entertainment medium that nearly everyone enjoys. Like you're not required to enjoy it, but you know, you have my, my mother's like 68 and she plays games on her tablet and on her phone and on her computer. Uh, and they might not be the same types of games that I play, would she classify herself as a gamer? Absolutely not. Um, and it's great to see that people have been brought together over the pandemic through games and games have helped people so much through the pandemic. It's hard to imagine what would have happened to, you know, our society, our, our work progress, you know, mental health states, you know, social communication, if this pandemic had happened 20 years ago. I think that because of the internet, because of technology, because of games, it has made it much more, you know, e easy to handle, survivable, um, because we are able to have that communication and those social interactions and engagement through games that we wouldn't have had at that time. Yeah. Definitely agree. I, I think it's great that everyone's a gamer now, even if they don't call themselves a gamer. I mean, if you play phones, like games on your phone, you're technically a gamer. So it's not, there's not so much gatekeeping around what that term means anymore. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. I find it uh, fascinating that as you're both like talking about, obviously, development, 
and as well as events themselves, like one thing keeps coming back and that's diversity. Like being able to bring a diversity of not just people in, to the games themselves, but also people behind the games. And as we're going into 2022, how do we, how do you see diversity working to bring even more people or how do we set it up so that the lessons that we've learned uh, by going remote, by being able to reach out to new audiences. Like, how do we keep that going? How do we keep diversity in mind when setting up events or setting up a, you know, a new de development studio or anything like that? Like, what are some of the things that you think that people should look out for as well as some of the lessons that you would like to see move forward as of next year? Do you want to start? I could talk for like an hour on this, so I think I'll let you go first. <laughs> so can I, but I, I no, think, I think this, this is a great here. topic. Yeah, no, I love it. I, I think um, the first and foremost thing is accessibility, which you mentioned, and there are so many virtual resources and uh, communities popping up online. So whatever your interest is, especially in gaming and esports. Um, you know, one of our goals at Enlight is to make sure we have the most curated and trusted resource section for um, for people who are interested in esports careers. And so, you know, that's just one of many that we offer. But there's plenty of other orgs. I'm sure IGDA has plenty of resources as well along the similar lines. Um, so definitely search them out if, um, and, and they're accessible. Um, so we definitely have done a better job of being accessible to everyone who wants to go out and search for it um, in terms of content and self-learning and education and things like that. Um, and when, when you're talking about like figuring out how to make workplaces more inclusive and diverse, Gosh, this is a huge topic. How do I start? So I know that companies are definitely making huge push around this. It's a huge conversation where it, the workplaces are becoming friendlier to include people that are others and, and do not um, always or are not the normal type of people that you used to see in gaming publishers and developers and companies five, 10 years ago. Um, what we need to do a better job with is really focusing on how diverse talent can get into those companies and then how they can be included so they can continue staying at those companies uh, without being pushed out by, let's say, a toxic workplace or feeling like they're the token person in the room or, uh, you know, a bunch of other microaggressions and, and small things we can all list out. So um, there's just been a huge improvement in terms of conversation and the level of standards that now the industry has for itself on what that looks like. And uh, it's been great to see a lot of, not great, I shouldn't say that, it's been, it's been encouraging to see that a lot of people have spoken up and uh, put their foot down and set those boundaries and say, hey, this is not okay, we need to do better. And it's unfortunate that it wasn't better in the past, but it's encouraging to see that now we all gather around knowing what's right to do and how we should be treating each other in the workplace, especially, and, um, and have that in mind moving forward as companies are continuing to grow and hire, especially after the COVID boost. So. Um, I'll, I'll start it there, Renee, and, and I'll throw it to you, but I'm, yeah, I'm sure we have so many aspects to talk about. Of course, of course, no, wonderful start there. Um, and, and I think you're right. It's very encouraging to see so many people come forward. Um, certainly at the IGDA, we got a lot of questions from reporters who aren't as familiar with the game industry. And they're saying, oh, like all these allegations are coming forward. Like, how do you feel about like your industry? Isn't it going downhill? And like, no, it's actually going it's improving the fact that people feel empowered to come forward, that they don't feel like they're going to lose their careers, that they feel like they can speak up is a good sign of progress. Because a, a lot, it's not like these issues didn't exist in the past. You know, a lot of them are from the past. And the fact that we are 
able to discuss them. They are, we're able to address them. We're able to hold companies and people accountable is a really, really positive step forward. And now you know, we, we just have a lot of progress to make. So we have to come together and create policies and ensure that companies are being you know, inclusive and equitable and diverse. Uh, and with the IGDA itself, you know, we had a 2021 developer satisfaction survey. We run this survey every two years. And within that survey, we actually had, I'm gonna look at my numbers, 87% uh, of developers felt that diversity in the workplace was important. 89% of developers felt that diversity in the content that they're creating is important. And 90% of developers felt that diversity in the games industry overall is important. We've never seen numbers like that before. I mean, that's basically you know, nine in 10 game developers, 90% of game developers across the board think that diversity and inclusion is an utmost priority when it comes to the success of the game industry and the content we're creating. And I completely agree with that because the only way that we can create, you know, the, the best content, you know, the, the, the most intriguing range of content is to have an intriguing range of people. And so we need diversity. We need people from different backgrounds. We need people uh, from different cultures. We need people who have different socioeconomic experiences, who are married and unmarried and, you know, cis and LGBTQ plus and all of us need to, to come together and share our stories and our visions because diversity among any group of people allows that group of people to not only create more diverse content, but to more effectively solve problems. Your diversity just sort of makes sense. If you have five people who all went to the same college and all grew up with the same background, they're going to approach the same problem one way. Uh, if you have five different people who have different backgrounds, some went to college, you know, some were trained in different ways, they went to different colleges, they're probably going to approach the same problem five different ways. And that is going to get you to a, a fixed, effective answer much, much quicker. So when it comes to improving diversity within our industry, I think there's a little bit of a chicken and egg problem. The more that we create diverse content, the more that we can inc encourage diverse people to play our games and to also feel like they're connected to our industry, that they can be part of our industry, that they're welcome there. Uh, it helps to have diverse people to make that diverse content, though. We're slowly making progress. You know, we're seeing more women in the game industry than ever. We're seeing more uh, you know, people from different backgrounds in the game industry than ever. But we need to, to keep focusing on that. And while some companies have done a really good job of diverse recruiting, I think a lot of companies haven't done a good job with diverse retention because there are issues of toxicity. You know, there's issues of discrimination and bias, whether it's conscious or subconscious, and it requires proactive effort in order to have equity. So everyone feels like they're being treated equally and being given equal opportunities. So there are many steps we can take in that regard, but I do think that the pandemic has done a wonderful job of pushing us further along that route. And, you know, the, the recent lawsuits and other allegations that have come forward have really snapped attention of some executives who probably weren't paying attention as much as they should about this extremely important issue. Yeah. Yeah, and, and that's such a huge problem to solve because, I mean, there's just so many parts. When I say that, I mean diversity and inclusion in the industry, um, and, and there's so many parts to it, right? Because, I mean, you mentioned uh, having enough women or, or underrepresented groups in the workforce um, as one problem, so it's a hiring problem, and then the second problem is retaining them. Um, and, you know, from that, that's like the base problem, but from that, we have the entire pipeline to think about sure. where, uh, it's not necessarily just a hiring problem, right? It's, it's accessibility of resources. It's, it's training. It's how do we, uh, train and prepare candidates that are from rep underrepresented groups that may not have gone to the best colleges or may not have access to being in the biggest cities to network at events or, um, all of these factors that that fall into the category of um, accessibility. And so essentially, we're now looking at gaming as part of our our lifestyles across society from 
uh, childhood all the way up to college where now people are starting to pre prepare and look for jobs. Um, but we have to think about how to make that entire pipeline and that lifestyle equitable, right? And, and normal that everyone is a gamer. So boys and girls and, and, and non-binary people are playing games together from a young age. Uh, they are all in the computer club or esports club um, equitably, uh, ideally, um, at school, in high school, in college, they're all competing at the same level, things like that, all the way up to continuing that momentum and that interest in gaming and esports so that that everyone who plays games actually want to go into working in the industry. And there's so many steps along that way where people get discouraged, right? Like, um being, I was the only person in my computer science class in high school, the only woman, I mean, um, and it was weird. Um, I was probably one of two women studying computer science in college, which was also weird. Um, and, uh, you know, if, if that's where I stopped being interested in games and I never would continue being in the game industry as I have now. So it's definitely a lot of different steps in the process to think about on how we can improve diversity and inclusion and keep people interested, but also continue to encourage them, guide them and prepare them so that they can get hired because these companies are looking for diverse candidates, but we still want to make sure candidates are, are passionate, excited, prepared and trained at the same time. Um, so there's that entire pipeline that I, I really focus on through in light um, as, as my full time job and, and really think about that pipeline for the most part. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think that entire pipeline is is so important. I occasionally hear people think that it, sexism isn't an issue these days and it's only an issue in like very specific circumstances. When I was in second grade, I finished my math unit early, way early, months, months early for uh, second grade and asked to get more math because I loved math. Math was my favorite subject and it was my favorite thing to do at school. My second grade teacher told me girls don't need to know more math. Then like long division was what we learned. Right. And it, I think a lot of people don't understand unless they face those hurdles themselves that they're still out there, that it's still you know, you have to overcome your second grade teacher uh, being sexist in order to pursue a, a degree in STEMs and then to eventually get into the game industry. And so we, not only as game developers, but as a whole society, need to address these issues at all levels that they're present in order to give everyone an equal opportunity to pursue the careers and dreams that speak to them. Absolutely. Uh, obviously, there's a lot of talk about education. Like what are some of the steps that you think that we, that are being taken now to uh, increase diversity within education? And is there anything else that we can be doing? I'm thinking about uh, communities, a lot of digital sort of like discord communities that started to pop up to help to mentor some of like the students or to help to uh, bring together like smaller developers within like different communities. It could be the whole state, it can be like a whole area, uh, things like that. What what excites you moving into 2022 uh, around education or what would you like to see happen? Uh, yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> no, go ahead, Renee. Hey, Renee then. Okay, Sorry. I was gonna yeah. say, yeah, I mean, that's pretty much all, all the IGDA does. Uh, you know, we, we have, we provide free educational resources. We provide other uh, opportunities. We just launched last year our global mentorship program. So people anywhere in the world can get mentorship within the games industry. And then of course we have our wonderful local chapters and special interest groups, as well as now our regional coordinators who help get everyone together in a region, whether it is U.S. West Coast or as you know, Southeast Asia to to connect and talk about the game industry in their areas, connecting with each other, networking, providing each other support, and in in the terms of improving our industry 
overall, I mean, we, we've recently published a white paper called Guide for Game Companies, How to Create and Sustain a Positive Work Culture. So we're working at even educating leadership on what they need to do in order to improve these workplace situations for everyone. And we're about to publish on December 8th, uh, a new white paper, which is inclusive game design and development, which is all through the you know, inclusive and diverse game development process from building your team to researching and designing your world to accessibility considerations in your mechanics, all the way through community management and marketing. And uh, just uh, where can people like check out that white paper or where where is it going to be posted? Yeah, that's going to be on IGDA.org in our resource library. You can find all those papers for free. Awesome. Uh, Eunice, obviously education is very important to you. I would say even like esports, just working through the educational, like how people understand like how esports work. Uh, what what do you see moving forward? What do you think are some of like the bill the big things that matter to you when it comes to uh, helping other people to learn about that? Uh, yeah. About your work? The biggest, yeah, the biggest thing for us is really. Uh, being transparent and sharing how the esports ecosystem works with everyone so they can and how the different jobs exist and what different jobs exist so uh, people can actually prepare themselves and their skill set and apply it to one of the jobs that they're the most interested in or many jobs. Um, but the biggest issue that we see today is essentially there's so many people and talented candidates with skill sets. They just don't actually know that their skill sets apply to esports, right? That we have, um, you know, someone, one of our members at Enlight uh, joined us and said, hey, I'm an IT person uh, or, or I'm a video editor and I'm an IT person at a college, but I want to get into esports and I don't know how to do that. And people don't understand that these uh, events require huge IT crews, right? You have LAN events, you have uh, stadium events, you have taxes and, and community events and Twitch cons. Who do you think is setting up these computers? Like there's a huge IT crew that need to troubleshoot, that need to make sure computers are being set up. Um, there's networking crews, there's um, people that make sure the internet's running, right? There's all of these jobs that people don't even know exist in esports and gaming, and they're a huge backbone of the industry. So our goal with Enlight is really bringing transparency to what jobs exist. And once people understand what jobs exist, then they can say, oh, okay, I guess my IT skills actually matter and could be used in esports. But without that transparency, without knowing that there's IT crews jobs in, in esports, how, how could someone even apply for them, right? Or how could someone even understand the connection between their skill set and what the job entails? And so we do that in light through uh, bringing in industry leaders to teach master classes about the jobs that they do. And um, they're through live sessions every month. Uh, members can come and ask direct questions to some of these industry leaders, which is an incredible opportunity. And um, from that, we also separately do career coaching sessions. So I do a lot of career coaching sessions where we talk about things that schools don't teach anymore, which I felt like I depended on my career counselor a little bit in the past, but I don't know if it's true anymore nowadays where like, how do you write your resume? How do you present yourself in an interview? How do you um, deal with confidence or discouragement when you're being rejected from jobs? How do you plan and, and how do you manage your time, right? Um, how do you get things done? So all of these things that I feel like we just learn uh, by ourselves, sometimes the hard way, um, these are things that I love talking about and coaching people through and giving tactics and, and tips around that. So we do a lot of career coaching sessions as well. Um, because I feel like these soft skills are incredibly important, not just like through for your career, but also for life in general. So, so those are the kinds of masterclasses and, and sessions that we do at Enlight. Um, and yeah, we're also planning, we did a six week boot camp this year in August and July, where um, students came in with no experience, but they could sign up for one of our tracks between broadcasts 
social media, event management, and um, talent management. And 40 students went this through this program. Half of them were scholarships for diverse candidates from underrepresented groups. And the entire class came together after six weeks and ran a Valorant tournament that we put on the front page of Twitch. So a lot of these students came in and members that came in had zero experience doing anything. And so when we told them, hey, well, you're going to be running a tournament by the end of six weeks, a lot of them were super nervous and all they needed to hear was that we would be there to believe in them. We would guide them through everything. And the event turned out to be a success. Um, and I truly believe that anyone given the resources, the training, the opportunity can learn to do what they want. Uh, you know, there's no limit to our learning and it's just a matter of having that opportunity to learn new skills, having someone believe in you and tell you that you can do it. And then you'll achieve so much more than you, you think you could. So, you know, those, that six week boot camp was a great success. Um, we'll probably replicate it next year in some form. Um, but our monthly membership is also something that we do a lot of teaching through. And so those two things that we've done this year has just been incredible because you know, it's it's not necessarily just giving, just teaching. It's more around, you know, I'm a huge believer in improving your life in different ways. And I don't know if, like, I, I never did well, that well in school. Like, I did well academically, but I hated it. <laughs> I just did it for the sake of doing it. But um, I care more about the life coaching and the career coaching and, setting goals and setting intentions and then reaching those goals and finding your purpose and things like that, that I feel like is very much not talked about in esports. And so I really try to bring that perspective into everything that we talk about and make it a very sort of um, wholesome and, and very kind community that we've been building. That's a wonderful approach. I really love that. Thank you. Um, I mean, speaking of that, like community, I think is so important right now, uh, especially within, you know, development studios with with games, with teaching, education, things like that. Like, what what kind of lessons or what are you seeing within like community building uh, that you would like to see like move forward or like some of the lessons that you've learned in the past year that you think other people should know about in order to, you know, strengthen communities or like encourage diversity within communities? Uh, at least on the IGDA side, you know, we've been working a lot with our chapters and special interest groups to get them the support they need so that they can support their communities and help those communities grow and thrive. And what we've seen from supporting the community leaders is at least within the game industry, what they need are clear tools to, to help manage their communities, clear guidelines for how to plan events and to handle issues within their communities, and then just other ways to boost their confidence uh, as leaders. I think that imposter syndrome is a huge plague within the game industry. I don't know anyone uh, that I can think of who doesn't at least at some point experience imposter syndrome within the games industry, because when you have all of these amazing, intelligent, passionate, creative people coming together, they compare the flaws they know in themselves or the, the, the places where they know they're not as strong to the strengths they see in others. And they always feel like they're coming up short when that's not the case at all. And so I find that doing everything you can empower these other people, both people within your community and your community leaders is the best step to getting those communities to really thrive. And if you get them into this sense of empowering themselves and empowering each other, then it really helps those communities thrive because they'll continue to uplift each other. And that just really folds back into itself and continues to support the community. Yeah, I think, I think communities are so interesting because they really take on the culture of, of whatever, I don't know, maybe the founder of the community or like the influencer that starts the community or the org. Um, but I, I think, for me, uh, learning 
also what you mentioned, Renee, like, I think it's just about empowerment because I think people respond better to encouragement than, than the other way around, right? Like we, we have enough toxicity in other areas and discouragement in other areas. Like we don't need to be in communities and surround ourselves with people who are in, in that position or, or have those voices in our head. So um, yeah, I, I feel like encouragement has been an empowerment has been a huge part of the Enlight community and people really feel safe asking for advice or um, mentorship or uh, just sharing what they celebrated and, and maybe some discouraging things that they want, encouraging words about. Um, so I think just having a safe space with like-minded people on the same like-minded journey is is a great start. Yeah. Uh, I mean, going into, you know, developing communities, bringing diversity in, uh, how do you reach out to new audiences? How do you encourage someone who hasn't even thought about coming into games to come into games? How do you reach out to someone who hasn't even thought about playing games to start th playing games? I think there's like discoverability, obviously, there are so many like new areas, not just here, not just here in like North America, but like around the world. And like, what are some of the things that you're doing right now? Or some of the things that you're starting to think about when it's like, okay, how do we reach people in South Africa? How do we reach people in India? How do we reach people in Australia or Germany or any of these other places that you're starting to see uh, developers starting to come up, you're starting to see a uh, new audience starting to come up, or you're starting to see uh, people trying to tell their own stories. Like what are, what from maybe this year, or what are some of the things that you're most excited about? So on the IGDA side of things, what we really focus on is identifying local community leaders and potential community leaders and empowering them because you know as much experience as we have working with communities around the world the people who are going to know those communities best are the people who are part of them and so it's really empowering those leaders to get the tools they need get the resources they need you know have the speakers come in to talk to their communities that they need in order to uplift others and by empowering those communities those are the ones that are going to have the best reach for their you know, the, the other people in their local community who aren't part of games yet, who don't even know about game development yet. Uh, on the, the age side of things, um, one of the things that we launched last year, we'll be hosting this next year as well, is the IGDA worked with Legends of Learning to have a game design challenge, which is a, a four week program that taught students, you know, K through 12 pretty much as, as young as you can get them in school, all the way up through uh, pre-college, pre-university, about game development. So it took them through you know, the initial drafting of a concept and the initial design, and then milestone planning, forcing them to do project planning, and then doing prototyping and user testing, and then all the way through creating a, a full finished product, whether that is something that they program or it, it supported paper prototyping too. So you could have, you know, we had one of our contest winners was an adorable second or third grader. I think he was eight years old, but he had made this wonderful game out of paper and, and talked about uh, how the, the theme inspired him and how it played. We were just really, really impassioned to see that. So that was extremely effective. Um, I think Legends of Learning has something like 2 million students that they wow. connect with. So we had great reach there. We saw over 7,000 students participate uh, over a thousand classrooms. And then uh, we had over 300 projects entered in our, our contest, which was completely optional as well. So we're gonna be hosting that again. And I imagine we're gonna have even a greater turnout because we got wonderful feedback. And it's that kind of outreach and working with teachers and working with people who are familiar with these age groups or these communities that really helps let students or, or people from other groups know about these opportunities within the games industry. Yeah, and, and I really love that. I think all of that is, is super important for 
Um, especially the local reach that you have in person is, is super important. At Enlight, we don't have that right now in terms of the local chapters or anything like that. Um, what we do is really make everything virtual and online and have a centralized location for a lot of our resources that anybody can sign in and watch or join. Um, I do like the question about how we are as a whole sort of attracting more people into gaming and esports because I think uh, with Enlight, it's been interesting to propose to someone that, hey, gaming might not just be a hobby for you, right? Esports might not just be a hobby. You could actually have the skill set to work in the industry if you so want to, if you so choose to. And so it's... Um, that's the way we've been really approaching it and getting more people engaged in what we're doing and learning about how they can make gaming a larger part of their life as opposed to just, you know, watching it after work or playing it after work or whatnot and having to divide their, their attention. So um, really opening up to people that it, it can actually be a job. It could actually be part of your life. So that's how we've been approaching it. That's fantastic. Um, I mean, We've talked about a lot about like obviously the past the what what has happened this year, twenty twenty one. Well, goodbye twenty twenty one. Hello twenty twenty two. I want to hear about your next year. I want to hear about the amazing things that you're working on, what you're excited about. Like, what does your twenty twenty two already look like, or what are some of the things that are on your wish list for twenty twenty two? in-person events more <laughs> many people again i miss people um i've actually started going back to in-person events as safely as i can so far i was luckily able to attend um pax west and awe uh gdex and, and some other events um but for for 2022 you know the iga is looking to attend gdc in person we'll have our special interest group round tables mentor cafe, our booth, our annual general meeting. So that's gonna be really exciting. Of course, as I mentioned, we're gonna be having that game design challenge again. So empowering students to learn about game development and project management. Uh, and then we, we have many other things planned. I'm not sure how many I'm allowed to talk about, uh, but I, we're really looking forward to seeing our communities feel comfortable returning to in-person events. Um, you know, the IGDA is so much our local chapters and communities and how they empower game developers and help them network. And so we really are focusing on uplifting them so that as soon as, say, as, soon as it is safe for them, they feel like they can start hosting a successful events and really providing the knowledge and resources and networking opportunities that game developers need in order to truly thrive. Excellent. Yeah, that's awesome, Renee. I'm, I'm excited to see the presence at GDC. That sounds really cool. Thank you, thank you. Yeah. Um, for Enlight, we are doing a lot of stuff virtually, but also hoping to do more uh, events at, at some of the grassroots ones. So uh, get grassroots one like uh, PAX and TwitchCon potentially. Um, but also at local colleges. So we definitely have more of a focus on training and uh, career development. So it makes sense for us to be in colleges where we could be doing hands-on training, where people are uh, familiar with the concept of classes and, and taking classes and learning actual skill sets that they can apply to things that they see on streams, like running tournaments, for example. So basically doing an iteration of our boot camps, but in person, ideally. Um, and a lot of the grassroots and community events like PAXs and TwitchCons, where there are a lot of members um, and students generally go to, especially from colleges. And so we definitely want to tap into that. So there's, uh, there's a lot there, but uh, I think there is going to be a lot online that is going to be huge. So definitely follow us on Twitter or follow us on our newsletter because um, online is, it has just definitely been great for us because accessibility has just been a huge part of, of making this more accessible to everyone and, and learning more about the industry and how it works. So um, 
keep that in mind. Um, we'll have like giveaways and scholarships throughout the year. We'll have a lot. We'll have a free workshop program in January that is focused on esports career education and development. So definitely sign up for our newsletter to, to learn about that. Um, and yeah, there's just going to be so many campaigns and events throughout the year, um, all focused around esports and gaming career education and development. And is the Twitter in light GG or is it? <laughs> yes, the Twitter is in light GG. Our website is in light.gg. Um, and I suggest signing up for the newsletter that you'll, you'll get it direct into your inbox and we don't spam at all, but, um, yes, we'd love to see you all join us in some capacity. Yeah, I will definitely sign up for that newsletter. Oh, yeah. Um, I, I, I look forward to hearing about those opportunities. Um, we have a newsletter too. So if anyone wants to sign up for it, they can. It's on our website. If you go to IGDA.org, uh, I think under resources, there's the insider newsletter. And uh, we send out a, a weekly newsletter on Wednesdays that has industry updates and events. So if you're looking to see free talks and conferences that are coming up, we have that all listed out on our newsletter as well as you know articles about current events within the industry excellent uh obviously with the few minutes that we have left is there anything that uh any final words any words of encouragement for people going into 2022 any last thoughts about 2021 or any hopes for the future I think hope is probably the best topic that I, I want to touch on. I know that right now, like the Omicron variant is coming up and a lot of people are worried. Um, but I would say that we, we, we should be hopeful. I, I think we're overcoming this and it is okay. It's okay to be tired. It's okay to be burnt out. It's okay to, to be emotionally drained from these varying expectations of when we get to return in person. I know a lot of people have been hard on themselves because they haven't been as productive as usual for the last two years. And that's perfectly fine. You know, it's a global pandemic. You know, there was a, a recession in there for a bit. It's extremely stressful. So if you're not feeling as creative as usual right now, or if you're not feeling as productive as, as usual right now, it's okay. Like just be, be easier on yourself because you know, this too shall pass and it will return to normal. And I imagine that your motivations and your creativity will return as well. Yeah. I love that. That's so great. Um, I would say definitely take a break and focus on yourself and rejuvenate with over the holidays, whether that's by yourself or with friends or with family or however you want to spend it, but definitely focus on rejuvenating and not trying to continue to grind throughout the holidays and, you know, whatever you think you can be productive on over the holidays, if you're burned out or if you're not excited about doing it, it's going to be really hard to make actual productivity happen. So just take the break, enjoy yourself, come back rejuvenated at the end of December, at the beginning of January, and really focus on how to set goals and what you want to achieve for the year and do some reflection around that and be intentional about it, um, as opposed to just going through every day, trying to grind through your, your daily tasks. Those, those can potentially wait. So definitely keep that in mind. Keep yourself in mind and enjoy the holiday season. Absolutely. Self-care is best care. So to wrap things up, uh, Renee, where can people find you, follow you, learn your words of wisdom? Yeah. Uh, so obviously most of our resources are on IGA.org. If you want to follow any of IGA's social accounts, if you want to join our Discord with other 4,500 game developers on it, you can find it all on our sidebar there. If you want to follow me personally, uh, probably the best is uh, Twitter or LinkedIn. LinkedIn is just my name, obviously. Uh, Twitter, you can find me, Riku Kat. That's R-I-K-U-K-A-T. Uh, and I, you'll, you'll get some game industry insights and pictures of food. Perfect. Uh, Eunice? Uh, uh, we, I am at, on Twitter at Eunice Chen. And Enlight is on Twitter at EnlightGG. Our website is enlight.gg, so definitely check that out. Um, but yeah, feel free to DM me anytime if you have any questions, 
Um, whether it's about your own career journey, whether it's about in line, I'm happy to help. So definitely feel free to reach out. And I'm so happy to have been here. Nice to meet you all. <laughs> yeah, it's a pleasure. Here. Yeah, it's been fun. This has been fantastic. Thank you so much, both of you, for being here and uh, talking a little bit about 20, about the past, a little bit about the future, and spreading a little hope. So yeah, and thank thank you to the audience for for sticking around and. Uh, to listening hopefully you got something out of this and uh hopefully you'll start designing games or be a participant as it be so uh with that have a great uh, rest of the year and hopefully even better next year so yeah happy new year happy new year everyone happy new year